Good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar, which is co-hosted by SIAC and the Indian Council of Arbitration. This is the first part of the SIAC ICA webinars on the way forward for arbitration. In today's webinar, the panelists will discuss tips and techniques for efficient conduct for arbitration proceedings. Before we begin today's panel discussion, I would like to introduce Mr. Arun Chavla, the Deputy Secretary General of FICI and advisor for the Indian Council of Arbitration, who will be giving opening remarks. Mr. Arun Chavla. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you and your families are all safe in these pandemic times. I welcome you all to this webinar on arbitration in India, the way forward a joint initiative of the Indian Council of Arbitration with the Singapore International Arbitration Center. Friends, we are all aware of the volume of pendency of suits in the Indian courts, which proverbially stands like a democracy sword over the hapless litigants. For the sake of brevity, I will not harp on these stupendous figures of pendency but sufficient to say that they are glaring enough to discourage business activity and in particular foreign investments. One of the most uh, significant global trends has been the increasing popularity of arbitration as a preferred means of resolving commercial disputes. It is therefore compelling and obvious for India to adopt a pro-arbitration approach and strengthen the institutions and the entire ecosystem that supports arbitration as a dispute resolving mechanism. Many landmark steps have been taken in the last few years to bring about an environment conducive to the growth of arbitration in India. But obviously much more needs to be done. Ladies and gentlemen, at this webinar, we are extremely privileged to have with us a very powerful panel of speakers to discuss and deliberate the techniques, tips and strategies for making arbitration the most efficient mechanism for resolving commercial disputes in India. So without much ado, I will request Mr. Zareer Bharucha, partner ZBA, who is the moderator for this discussion, uh, to introduce the panel. Uh, and initiate the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chawla. Um, I believe the panel needs no introduction. Shweta, would you be kind enough to say a few words about the panel and then I'll make a few opening prefatory remarks before we dive straight into the session. As Mr. Chavla mentioned, uh, the session will be moderated by Mr. Azari Garucha, partner ZBA, um, and, and joining him on the panel are uh, Mr. Avinash Pradhan, partner at Raja and Tan Singapore, uh, Ms. Shanine Parik, partner at Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas, and also a court of RSIC arbitration, um, Mr. Nakul Divan, senior advocate, Supreme Court of India, and barrister at 20SX. Mr. Dimitrios Kasiki, Senior Associate at Sherman and Sterling LLP. I think I will not waste any more time um, and I'll hand over the reins to Mr. Zari Barucha to take on the discussions further. Thank you, Shweta. Um, friends, thank you very much for joining us today. We have before us a distinguished panel. And I would like to add, say a few prefatory remarks before we, we start our session. Arbitration, and especially international arbitration, was conceived as an alternative to escape the rigidity, formalism, and time and cost associated with conventional litigation. Arbitration, it is said, has now lost its path and has begun to mirror many of the evils of the court system. Indeed, some de critics declare that arbitration offers the worst of both worlds, as users do not get the finality they thought they bargained for, when awards are set aside, and the, and the constant complaint is that costs exceed that of litigation. With this background in place, today's topic for discussion is both timely and relevant. We will be debating the techniques to be adopted in ensuring that arbitration remains what it was originally envisaged, namely 
a private dispute resolution process that is quick, fair, cost-effective, and final. The conversations we will have range over an array of issues, commencing with the agreement to arbitrate, the choice of the seat, choice of arbitrator, conduct of arbitration. We will deliberate on inter interim protective measures, security for costs and claims, summary adjudication, witness gating, anti-arbitration injunctions, and more. Bearing in mind the ultimate overriding objective, which is to get a favorable award in a timely and cost-effective manner that is ultimately monetizable, i.e. enforceable. So whatever techniques one adopts, the ultimate aim must be to ensure that the award is enforceable. With that in view, gentlemen, we will go straight to the, que um, to the questions I have for Nakul. Nakul, I wanted to ask you about the significance of the place and seat of arbitration as a part of the overall strategy um, when adopting um, arbitration. I mean, even before one commences arbitration, when one is contemplating an arbitral clause, what is the significance? Why is the place so important? Um, and in the Indian context, particularly, we've seen preemptive strikes being made with parties filing applications in courts, which otherwise have no connection with uh, the dispute, simply with a view to ensuring that Section 42 of the Act gets triggered. Um, could you shed some light on this, given that the Act does not specifically contemplate in express terms the seat of the arbitration. Thanks, Arir. I mean, let me, let me take cue from a point you made a little earlier on, which is, has arbitration lost its path? And the debate about place and seat is, in fact, an indication to suggest that perhaps in a number of jurisdictions, just to get an arbitration to commence on time uh, could be problematic. Uh, and to that extent, I mean, I would agree. I mean, arbitration has lost its path. Now, the entire debate about place and seat has been a litigator's delight. And the reason why it's been a litigator's delight is because there is something to be gained from the language that is used. Uh, we've, if, you, if you look at the uh, Yunsutral model law where all of this began, it said place of arbitration. But all of us who practice arbitration know that there is a distinction between seat and there's a distinction between venue. And section 20 of the Indian Arbitration Act uh, makes that distinction without a change in the use of the word place. It says an arbitration can be, uh, can be held in a particular place and it can again move from a particular place to another place. I mean, that's really the distinction. And at one place, it means seat. At another place, it means uh, venue. Now you've had a number of uh, Indian decisions on this. Uh, I don't want to bore the audience with uh, telling you what they say. I'm certain, I'm quite certain that uh, the audience knows about it, but it's not just, it's not just India. I mean, it's also English law, uh, which has had this uh, issue that they've grappled with. And the reason why you have uh, this as a problem, uh, as I mentioned, is because there is something to be gained uh, for a party which wants to make use of this little distinction that exists. Because what seat does is that it confers the juridical court with jurisdiction. So that jurisdiction gets conferred for the pers from the perspective of setting aside an award. It gets conferred for the perspective, from the perspective of granting interim relief. And if you end up in a court which is not the court of the seat, and you believe there's something to be gained, then you do it. Uh, that is why it is extremely necessary to be able to be to be able to set this out very clearly in an arbitration clause uh, where you draw that distinction and you clarify it and you, and you set out that it's the seat of arbitration, uh, that, 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 the, that the place where you want to hold the arbitration is the seat of arbitration. You don't use the word venue, you don't use the word place because all of that could potentially be problematic. Uh, to your point in relation to section 42, again, it's, it's part of, uh, a number of decisions of the Supreme Court, the last of which has been a K, uh, decision, has been the decision in BGS SOMA. Uh, again, it arose because parties 
started going to different courts just because they wanted to try and get a particular favorable court to exercise jurisdiction. Uh, all of that now cannot be done simply because the Supreme Court of India has taken the view that it is the cho it is the court. I mean, it's the court uh, of the seat of arbitration which has exclusive jurisdiction. Now, if you're asking me how this is going to at some point become a non-issue, well, I think it can only become a non-issue and lead to faster and better uh, efficient uh, arbitration proceedings if in reality courts across India uh, for domestic arbitrations and courts across the world for international arbitrations start adopting the same standard. Uh, and by that, I mean not just the legal standard, which is all set, which is set out in the model law, uh, which a number of countries have adopted, but practically running arbitration related litigation proceedings in the same manner. Because if that consistency is brought about in different court systems, and there is going to be no difference uh, in running such a proceeding either before a court of an emerging country or before the court of a um, slightly more developed country, then there would be homogeneity and frankly, nobody would care about place, seat, or venue, because every party, uh, and if, it's a, if there's a recalcitrant defendant, would be aware that whichever court you go to, you would end up with the same consistent result. That's, that's interesting, um, Nakul, because you speak of um, the court, the designate court, which is designated as the seat of the arbitration, having exclusive jurisdiction. Does that brings us on to the anti-arbitration uh, injunction or an, arbitra an injunction granted in support of the arbitration. Um, and there's been a recent um, English judgment from the Court of Appeals uh, in, re in respect of, a, I think, a, a Turkish subcontractor in respect of a power plant in Russia, where the controversy was whether the seat of arbitration was in Russia or in London. So the homogeneity that one, one aspires to clearly is, is lacking even as of today. And that's uh, what parties, as you correctly say, try and arbitrage. They try and arbitrage on the differences. Um, can, you, can you share with us your, your thoughts on, on the anti-arbitration um, uh, injunction? So uh, Zareej, when you're looking at an anti-arbitration injunction, you're not just simply looking at an arbitration act under which parties have agreed to arbitrate. You're then looking at a slightly larger ecosystem, which is the, the, which is the parent civil procedure law that applies uh, to any civil proceeding that takes place within a host state. So in, from the perspective of India, uh, it would be uh, the civil procedure court. From the perspective of Singapore, it would be the rules of court. Uh, again, similarly for England. Now, when you're looking at that and you're looking at a, a, a party that approaches a court and says, I haven't signed an arbitration agreement, there's an arbitration that's taking place outside of your jurisdiction, but frankly, I have claims that are admissible uh, within your jurisdiction. The court has to get out of the contours of the Arbitration Act. Uh, and you've seen English judges, uh, again, in far and few cases, because they adopt the doctrine of exceptional circumstances, but you've seen English judges accept that English courts would have jurisdictions to have, have the jurisdiction to at least consider the issue. Uh, you have a very interesting judgment of the Indian uh, courts. This is the judgment, uh, the a judgment of a single judge of the Delhi High Court, uh, where an injunction was refused by the single judge in relation to an SIAC arbitration on the ground that such a petition was not even maintainable uh, under the Indian Civil Procedure Code. Now, I've, I've read that judgment and I know that judgment is an appeal uh, and, present, and currently there is an injunction against the Singapore arbitration from proceeding. But I'm not, I'm not certain that I completely agree with that uh, judgment for the simple reason that uh, you can't stop a court from not exercising power over a party that is within its jurisdiction. The court would have that power. The fact is that that court has to exercise the power in exceptional circumstances. Uh, courts have to recognize that arbitral tribunals have the power to determine their own jurisdiction. And if all things are equal, then frankly, it is for uh, the tribunal to make that decision. In fact, you have a Singapore court decision 
in a case called Malini Ventura, which uh, you know, looked at the chicken versus egg situation saying, who should decide first? And the Singapore court said, all things being equal, if there's a prima facie case that goes to arbitration, then let the arbitrator make that decision first. But that doesn't mean that they don't have jurisdiction to look at it. They do have the jurisdiction to look at it. And uh, when I talk about homogeneous standards, if courts across, I mean, let, let's talk about the common law world. If courts across the common law world adopt the same homogeneous standard of exceptional circumstances where they will consider granting an anti-arbitration injunction, then that's fine. It's the, pro the problem arises when courts start adopting different standards. And in adopting different standards, you end up having different courts which adopt different thresholds to grant those injunctions. That's the problem. Very insightful, Nakul. And uh, clearly that's a topic in itself. I mean, so given the constraints of time, I fear we, have, we, we won't be able to deal with that more fully. But um, nonetheless, the, the summary you've sh shared with us is an excellent uh, overview of the considerations that would arise when um, dealing with such issues. Uh, it's, it is rare. In fact, it's more common to see parties actually applying to injunct a recalcitrant uh, litigant who, in breach of an arbitration agreement, has commenced court proceedings elsewhere. But this is the reverse, and uh, uh, clearly in India, there's uh, uh, little or no uh, guide, judicial guidance. Yeah. Um, Zareen, perhaps, if I could uh, just make a sorry, if I could just make one brief point because you've mentioned India, and and that's really the cost regime. I mean, uh, you know that if you approached a Singapore court or an English court asking for an anti-arbitration injunction and you didn't get it, you wouldn't be saddled with an order of costs. That would rarely happen in India. And that's again, one aspect of uniformity that needs to be brought in. Thank you. Uh, um, Avinash, this ties into what we were going to ask you about security for costs under, uh, in Singapore, in your jurisdiction. Can you share with us the, the practice and procedure under uh, SEAC rules and even under, as a matter of court procedure, applications for security for costs. Um, also, if you could share with us the early dismissal uh, procedures, if any, under SEAC rules. Because one of the criticisms that has been leveled against arbitration is that um, arbitration arbitrators do not have the power to make a to summary um, procedure unlike the courts. Um, could you share, share the Singaporean experience with us? Sure, happy to, Zari. Thank you. Um, perhaps, perhaps I'll start by uh, uh, just, just following on from the discussion on security for costs. Could um, you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll just first touch on applications for security for costs. Now, there may be a concern on the part of a, a, a defendant to either a claim or a counterclaim, that even if the defendant succeeds in defending the claim, it will be out of pocket in terms of legal costs. And while in most arbitrations, costs will usually follow the event, there may be concerns about the difficulty of enforcement of an award of costs. Um, and there, there certainly may be concerns about the ability of the other party to the proceedings to claim it, to meet an order for costs. Now, the essence for an order, of an order for security for costs is that the claimant or defendant in the counterclaim, if that's the circumstance, um, is, is required to put up some form of monetary security for the costs of the defendant in the proceedings. And the provision of the security is usually a condition for the claim or counterclaim to be heard and to proceed. Now, it, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the jurisdiction for security for costs in court proceedings in Singapore is certainly very well established. And coming to the, the, the point that Nakul was, was making earlier, which I suppose links to the broader point of controlling vexatious litigation, um, it can often be a very useful tool for controlling that. Because the court effectively says that if you want to carry on with this, you need to put down some form of money to ensure that the defendant is protected. Now, the Singapore court procedures make extensive provision for this. Um, and, and, and the essence of it is that 
if the claimant, there is a suggestion that the claimant is impecunious, then the court will tend to lean in favor of, order, of, of making an order for security. Um, and the court also takes into account the ease or otherwise of enforcement of an order for costs. So let's say, for example, the claimant is situated in a foreign jurisdiction. Uh, that would be a factor that would lean the court in favor of making an order for security. Now, in arbitration, the situation is different because when you have an arbitration agreement, by definition, the parties have agreed to resolve their disputes by arbitration. Now, I, I, it, it, it is, however, at least under the rule, the SIAC rules, it seems clear that the tribunal would have jurisdiction to make some form of order for security for costs. It's expressly provided for under the SIAC rules, unless the parties have agreed otherwise, or the mandatory rules applicable to the arbitration prohibit it. The question though is, how does one treat an application for security for costs in arbitration? I mean, as, as is a common problem with arbitration, there is sometimes very little guidance in terms of rules that can be brought to bear on the arbitration. Now, the usual port of call of parties is to refer to the law of the seat of arbitration, but that may not necessarily be a perfect solution because the considerations that go into court proceedings and to the decision of courts with respect to controlling their processes don't necessarily translate to arbitration in the same way. Now, to me, the answer is that like most things in arbitration, the tribunal is accord, accorded with a measure of flexibility, which it should exercise sensibly. And there is now a fair amount of literature with respect to applications for security for costs in international arbitration. And a tribunal can and should be guided by that. As, as an example, uh, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators has in fact pulled together a, a detailed guideline on how one treats applications for security for costs. And that guideline descends into a fair amount of detail what it seeks to do is to draw together the threads across uh, and practice across jurisdictions and the practice of international arbitration and to synthesize some commonality of principles. And that, that forms a, a very helpful guide. Now, uh, coming, coming to, the, to, to your question with respect to applications for summary dismissal of, of claims. Um, now, one of the key innovations introduced by the SIAC in 2016 was a procedure for the early dismissal of a claim of defense. And that procedure is to be found in Rule 29 of the SIAC rules. Now, the language of Rule 29 makes very clear that, it is, that, that a, a claim for early dismissal can be concerned with either the merits of the case or for a claim being outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. So Rule 29.1 specifically states that a claim or defense can be summarily, summarily dismissed on the basis that is manifestly without legal merit or that a claim or defense is manifestly outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Now the phrase manifestly without legal merit, it's, 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 it's taken from the ICSID rules of procedure for arbitration proceedings, in particular Rule 41.5. Uh, so this, this, this is ICSID, it's concerned with investor state disputes. Now Rule 41.5 was introduced in 2006, and the reason for its introduction was because there were calls for greater efficiency in the investor state uh, arbitration process. There are, however, some very significant differences between the ICSID rule and Rule 29. Now the first difference is that the ICSID rules are concerned with a claim. However, Rule 29 of the SIAC rules makes very clear that a defense can be the subject of a summary dismissal. The second difference is that the ICSID rules specify that a tribunal must make its decision on an application promptly, but there is no time limit for a decision. On Rule 29 though, the tribunal, if it decides to proceed with the application, has a time limit of 60 days from the date of the application to make its decision. Now the third difference, and this is particularly important, the third difference is that while the exit rules provide that an application has to be made no later than 30 days after the constitution of the tribunal, there is under the SIAC rules, no time limit. 
So in theory, an application for summary dismissal can be brought at any stage of the arbitration process up till you have a dispositive award. Now, Arinash, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we, we can't hear you. Can you please speak up? It, we're finding it difficult to hear. Right. Is, is, that, is that better? Yes, please. If you could speak yeah, into it. Thank this, you. Yeah. yeah. So the, uh, as I was saying, the, third, the, the, the fourth difference that I'd like to highlight is that unlike its exit counterpart, under the SIAC rules, the tribunal is not compelled to make a decision on an application for early dismissal if it is filed. Rather, it is within the discretion of the tribunal to decide whether to proceed with the application. If it does proceed, then it must uh, decide the application, but it must first give the parties a reasonable opportunity to be heard. Now, what is the threshold for an application to be allowed? We have some guidance in the form of the exit decisions that have been uh, 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 passed on Rule 41.5. Now, those decisions suggest a high threshold. In one uh, a tribunal decision, the phrase manifestly without legal merit was equated to a claim being clearly and unequivocally unmeritorious. In another, it was equated to the claim being uh, untenable in a way that is evident and easily proved. So that tells us that the application would only be allowed in straightforward, clear cases. But the next question is, how should disputes of fact be treated? Do cases involving a dispute of fact, are such cases susceptible to treatment under Rule 29? Now, to me, it seems that a tribunal um, um, can only make a decision under Rule 29 in the clearest of cases. However, the tribunal need not take every assertion of fact at face value. There is some latitude to the tribunal in evaluating assertions made, which therefore suggests to me that there is also some latitude with respect to the tribunal's consideration of evidence in the context of a Rule 29 application. And a useful example of that is in a, a, a decision um, uh, involving the case, or the case of, of Trans Global Petroleum against the Kingdom of Jordan. And the tribunal in that case consisted of, of Professor McRae, uh, uh, Professor Crawford, and the late Johnny Weeder. And in that, in that decision, the tribunal recognized that it need not accept at face value factual allegations which were manifestly incredible, frivolous, vexatious, or inaccurate, inaccurate or made in bad faith. So that, in a nutshell, is Rule 29. And it is, I, I think one can see that it is a very powerful procedural rule, which if effectively utilized, has the potential to dramatically increase the efficiency of arbitration proceedings. Now for defendants, it presents a useful mechanism for disposing of claims which are frivolous and vexatious. For claimants, the procedure is perhaps going to be of utility in, in for example, claims on, on straightforward claims on guarantees, for example, where, or where, where, where an amount is admitted due and owing. But it also seems to me that an application under Rule 29 need not be in respect of the entirety of the claim or defense. And that tells us perhaps that the procedure could be utilized to separate the wheat from the chaff, to narrow the real issues and contention between the parties. So I, I think um, I've, I've gone on enough on, on, on Rule 29, but that, that is my perspective on it as a, as, as a mechanism for getting to greater efficiency in arbitration and addressing some of the criticisms that have, have, have been highlighted. Thank you, Avinash. I don't know how much of that I got because I was struggling to, to hear, but the, the rule that you mentioned, 29, was very interesting because I don't think the LCI or ICC have an equivalent, but isn't there a tension between um, the role of giving a, a, a party a fair hearing and a full opportunity to present their case um, with summarily striking out or preventing um, matters from proceeding. And, you know, this the, the tension was vividly illustrated in a recent uh, Singapore judgment in CBP versus CBS, where uh, it, the, the issue that arose was one of witness gating, where one of the parties wanted to leave witness evidence and the arbitrator refused and his award was set aside because the court came to the conclusion that the party was not given a, a, a full opportunity to present his case. And the courts very um, scathingly observed that 
expedition and efficiency is merely one consideration that has to be borne in mind by the arbitra arbitral tribunal. It's not the only or the, the predominant consideration. Uh, could, you, could you share some thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, taking, taking Rule 29 first and the concern with respect to natural justice, uh, it seems to me that really, that, that while, while I can appreciate the argument, ultimately it has to be borne in mind that natural justice is not protected or does not involve giving a party a full opportunity to present its case. Rather, natural justice is constituted by giving a party a reasonable opportunity to present its case. And that difference is key. Now, that's the first point. The second point is that concerns about natural justice are, I think, attenuated by the fact that summary dismissal procedures are very common in, 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 in court proceedings in many jurisdictions. Um, certainly as far as Singapore is concerned and the UK is concerned uh, and Malaysia, uh, it, is, it is perfectly permissible to bring applications and for the court to grant applications for summary judgment on the claim. And similarly for a court to strike out a defense if the, if the defense is frivolous and vexatious and manifestly unsustainable for, for, for want of a better description. And I understand that India may have similar procedures as well. So to the, to the degree that Rule 29 is, is irreconcilable with concepts of natural justice, I would disagree. I think that it is completely reconcilable. And in fact, many jurisdictions already have a built-in notion of the reconciliation within their own internal civil procedure rules. Now, coming to CVP, though, that is a, a, a very interesting decision. Um, it, I, 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 I think it's important to understand what happened in that case and how that case, uh, what happened in that case in order to understand how that case is to be extrapolated um, um, to a broader point of principle. Now, in CVP, uh, the, 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 the case itself concerned a contract of sale with respect to coal. Now, the applicable rules were the rules of the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration, that's the SCMA. And in this regard, the SCMA rules specifically provide that unless the parties have agreed to a documents only arbitration or that they have agreed that no hearing should be held, the, part, the tribunal is obliged to hold a hearing for the president presentation of evidence by witnesses, including expert witnesses. Now, as I mentioned, the case concerned a contract of sale. And the contract in question had been assigned to a bank, um, and that was permissible under the contract. Payment by the buyer was to be on a bill of exchange. Now, after delivery of the goods, the bill was accepted. But when payment was due, the buyer failed to pay. Now, in the next few, few months, the buyer responded to the bank, citing cash flow issues and saying it needed more time to pay. How after, after, however, after a few months of doing this, it suddenly raised a defense of, uh, to its liability, citing, for example, short delivery. And now this was many months after the delivery of the goods in question and many months after the bill had been accepted. Now, the party's representatives then met and the buyer alleged in the arbitration proceedings that during the course of that meeting, an oral agreement was reached for a new price to apply to the coal. The bank disputed this. Now, the bank commenced arbitration proceedings against the buyer and it filed a statement of claim. The buyer challenged the jurisdiction of the tribunal and the proceedings were very delayed. The challenge took about a year to, to be determined, but it was ultimately rejected. The tribunal then directed that the buyer file a statement of defense and counterclaim, but the buyer failed to comply. A hearing was tentatively fixed for some months later. Now, just before the hearing was to take place, the buyer then surfaced and said that it intended to file a defense and counterclaim. Now, look, this is the type of behavior which we are all familiar with. It really is the case of the recalcitrant defendant. Now, what the arbitrator did in response to this was to vacate the hearing and it gave the buyer time to file its defense and counterclaim. It also directed that the buyer submit a list of witnesses. Now, the arbitrator also asked the parties to consider the necessity of an oral hearing. Now, the buyer filed its defense and counterclaim, and it also um, um, filed a list of witnesses. And a key element of the defense was 
the agreement to the new price which the buyer said was reached, it could, you, you could tell from the defense that six of the seven witnesses which it intended to call were persons which the buyer alleged were present at that meeting. Now, so far, so good. What happens next, though, is significant. The bank filed a reply and defense to counterclaim, and in the same breath, it proposed a document on the arbitration. And it proposed that witness evidence was not required. And in response to this, the arbitrator asked the buyer to provide a written statement from each witness for the purpose of his deciding whether an oral hearing was necessary. Now, the buyer claimed in response to this that, that the direction or that, that position of the arbitrator was a breach of the rules of natural justice. It also highlighted that some of the witnesses which it wanted to call were actually representatives of the seller and that it would therefore need an oral hearing in order to take the evidence of these witnesses. The arbitrator in response to this made a direction that since the parties had not agreed to a documents only arbitration, an oral hearing would be conducted. However, the arbitrator also directed that there would be no witnesses presented at the hearing as the buyer had failed to provide witness statements or any evidence of the substantive value of presented witnesses. Now, that, that is the case that the court was confronted with. The, the tribunal, of course, found in favor of the bank, and so the, the, the buyer uh, applied to set aside. And the court accepted that the award should be set aside. But you can see that the issue here is because the arbitrator decided that all, all of the witnesses of the buyer would be precluded. Now, the court did note the various commentaries in the literature, which suggested that a tribunal has broad powers to limit the oral testimony of witnesses. But it held that while the expeditious disposition of matters was a relevant consideration in arbitration, that didn't grant the arbitrator free reign to reject all witness evidence in the interests of efficiency. So I, I, I think on a fair reading of, of the judgment, it is really concerned with an order which was very extreme. It wasn't an order to try and control the, the, the evidence that witnesses were to give in, in, in piecemeal, or for example, in order to limit the time for cross-examination. It was an order that had the effect of precluding the buyer from giving any witness evidence. And this was in the context of a claim which inherently involved issues of, of oral testimony. So it, it, it seems to me that, the, 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 that one can't take this case too far, but it does highlight that if you are going to gate witnesses, you have to be very careful in doing so. I would have thought that the usual solution to issues of this nature is rather than to expressly gate the witness, what you do is you, you, you give a direction to the effect that the buyer has to file its witness statements within a particular period of time. Once those statements are filed, the tribunal then can then take a view as to whether the witness evidence is relevant. And if, it, if, the, if the tribunal can then come to a view that it is immaterial or duplicative of other evidence, then perhaps one can exclude the evidence. What the tribunal shouldn't do is make a preclusive order at the stage of the proceedings that it did. The other thing is the tribunal, and this comes across very clearly, clearly in the judgment, the tribunal seems to have lost patience with the defendant. And that's a salutary lesson to both counsel in arbitration acting for claimants where you have a recalcitrant, recalcitrant uh, defendant, as well as a tribunal faced with a recalcitrant defendant. Don't lose patience. Issue the right directions, the court recognized that if the tribunal had issued a direction for the filing of statements and the buyer hadn't complied with that and hadn't given good reason for non-compliance, then uh, uh, th there wouldn't necessarily have been anything wrong with an order precluding the witness evidence. But unfortunately, that's not the basis of which the tribunal proceeded. Thank you, Avinash. That's a, that's, that's a very helpful summary and explanation of the rationale behind the court's uh, decision to set aside the award. It's remarkable given that in Singapore prides itself on um, non-interference. I think, you know, in, in the last 20 years, you've probably got less than a handful of cases that have been set aside by the courts. But I think there is a salutary reminder to both arbitrators and uh, 
practitioners that uh, when dealing with a recalcitrant debtor, one has to be very careful to ensure that um, the in the in 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 one's haste, one shouldn't be um, leaving the award vulnerable to challenge. I think uh, the tension is vividly illustrated by this case in terms of uh, the trying to get on with it and putting an end to uh, guerrilla tactics and delaying tactics. Perhaps the, the moral of the story is that the arbitrator allows the witness, but then controls the, the questioning and the relevancy of the evidence, uh, rather than trying to uh, stop a witness evidence being led at the threshold. And the other check and balance that can be imposed is costs. If the uh, tribunal comes to the conclusion ultimately that this has been a waste of time, he can uh, always um, uh, recompense the innocent party with costs. So that that's that's an interesting um, interesting uh, experience uh, that one has uh, witnessed in Singapore. Dimitrios, turning to you, can you tell us a little bit about um, your how you would view strategy in terms of trying to get security for the claim as opposed to security for the costs of the arbitration? Because that's clearly something that uh, parties would value in international arbitration. Um, what are the considerations? Is it is security for a claim only available uh, on proof of dissipation of assets? Is the crest as high as that of a Mareva? Uh, does one have to first make the application to the tribunal? Or can you rush to court? And what sort of material would uh, be required to support such an application? Yeah, sure. Th thank you, Zarir, and uh, hello to everyone who's listening. Um, I think for, for, for those who are, may not be familiar with, with what security for a claim is, it, it's quite a well-known measure, a request for interim relief, where essentially you request uh, a tribunal or a court uh, to secure either the whole or part of the amount in dispute. So the difference with security for costs is that we're not dealing with the cost of the arbitration, we're dealing with the disputed amount. And so that means uh, it's, it's also very, uh, it's different parties that have an interest to security for claim as opposed to the parties that have an interest in security for costs. Uh, typically, uh, the party that has an interest in security for claim is a claimant who thinks uh, for whatever reason uh, that they will be unable to make good on an award uh, that, they, that they get uh, as a result of the arbitration. And uh, sort of to echo a bit uh, what you said earlier in your introductions area, I think the, the most important consideration at the beginning of an arbitration uh, should in most arbitrations be the most important consideration at the end of an arbitration as well. And that is, can I get an enforceable award? So security for claim can assist in this respect. Uh, you find it in all the major rules. I think you also find it in, in the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Um, for example, in the SIAC rules, you'll find it in Article 27K uh, or Rule 27K. Um, but as you can imagine, re requesting a party to part with a disputed amount is a very heavy handed remedy. Uh, and it can really interfere with, uh, in the context of a commercial dispute, for example, a, a party's operation, its ability to operate to continue running its business. So it's only exercised, exercised sparingly by, by arbitral tribunals. And there's two quick points uh, I would like to make here from, from experience without, without going on for too long. Um, the first one is, it's often thought uh, that security for claim is only possible when you have evidence of dissipation of assets. Uh, in my experience, uh, this is not the case. Uh, so dissipation of assets here means when you have evidence that the other side is either moving assets, uh, you know, the, the respondent is moving assets to other companies in the group or to other individuals so as to make itself enforcement proof. Uh, and uh, we were involved in a case uh, where we were able to obtain security for claim successfully uh, without evidence of dissipation of assets. And I think what we need to remember here is that the test is always a risk of irreparable harm. 
So if you can prove to the tribunal that there's a risk, you're gonna walk out of the proceedings, a serious risk, you're gonna walk out of the proceedings empty-handed, even though you have a good claim on the merits, uh, that may be a ripe case for security for claim as an interim relief. Um, in our case, we were able to persuade the tribunal that um, if it did not grant security, um, uh, our case on the merits, which the tribunal had found, there was more than a reasonable possibility that we would succeed. Um, the, the other side will, would engage in protracted litigation in local courts, uh, and they had said as much uh, in the arbitration. Um, so that was good enough evidence for the tribunal to side on this one. Um, the other quick point I'd make about security for claim in relation to evidence gathering more general is that you need to be creative if you want to get security for claim with how you marshal the necessary evidence because um, a party won't, it will, you know, a, a respondent will never volunteer uh, that they are dissipating assets. They will never say, okay, I'm moving assets out of the jurisdiction. So, of course, uh, you have to think about this early, maybe even before starting an arbitration, uh, to get uh, an investigative company, uh, an investigator to look into the assets of the respondent, where, what assets did they have, where would they keep them. Uh, but even beyond that, it's important from an early stage to start creating a record. So you can write to the other side and say, uh, we are concerned that you are moving assets or that you do not have assets. Show us uh, uh, evidence of your financial stability or your financial health. Or if they do not respond, uh, make an order for document production of the same uh, evidence. So for example, uh, which is what we did in a, in a different case, if you get an order for document production uh, and the other side does not produce documents uh, about its assets, then you already have a, of course it's not a conclusive, it's not an open and shut case, but you have a good footing on which to request adverse inferences to be drawn about the other side's conduct. So that can get you a long way in terms of uh, getting security for claim, even if you don't have hard evidence uh, of dissipation. I don't know if that, if you have any yeah, follow-up. Yeah, that, that's helpful. In fact, uh, that brings me on to another question which ties into what we were discussing with Avinash, that in order to, to run uh, the tribunal to function efficiently, does the tribunal need to obtain the party's consent? I mean, most arbitrators, and this perhaps is become a, a, a common complaint about due process paranoia, where the arbitrator will almost inevitably seek parties' consent from everything. The most uh, sort of routine procedural directions and orders will be done with the consent of the parties. Um, any thoughts from your experience, Dimitrios? Um, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I agree with, again, with what you said earlier. I think if, if, and, and I think what Avinash said, especially with the example of, of the CBS case in Singapore, I mean, efficiency is important. Uh, and we're here in a webinar about uh, efficient techniques in international arbitration. Uh, but we should sometimes, I think, all this discussion about efficiency um, makes us uh, unable to see the wood for the trees. And, and the wood is to get an enforceable award. So to answer your question about consent, no, in, in my experience, you do not need consent of the parties uh, on procedural matters um, with, with very few exceptions under the, the major institutional rules. So the tribunal can run proceedings as it sees fit. But at the same time, as a, as a, as a claimant especially, or a counterclaimant, you want to make sure that you're not pushing for too efficient proceedings that will then risk the enforceability of the award. A good example is the, the, the case that Avinash talked about or the, um, the noble case that, uh, you know, th that involved an expedited procedure where the agreement provided for three member tribunal, but the, uh, the, the parties proceeded at an, an expedited procedure under a sole arbitrator. And, and the courts of Shanghai decided to, res to refuse enforcement on this basis, even though the courts of Singapore found differently. So the, the point is not whether the courts of Shanghai were correct. The point is you don't want to risk your award by, by trying to be too efficient. Um, and just the, a last quick point on this, um, I don't think you need consent, but what if we turn this on its head a little bit, what if you have consent on an issue as a tribunal, can you proceed nonetheless uh, differently? 
can you proceed differently despite the consent of the parties on an issue? Um, and there, uh, I think you'd be wise to, to, to tread carefully. Uh, so, you know, again, because you want to ensure that award is enforceable. But interestingly, under the SEAC rules and under the HKIAC rules, you do not have to follow uh, what the parties have agreed on on every issue. Uh, this is different in the ICC rules. You, if the parties agree on something, then you, you, you have to follow it as a tribunal. And I say this because in, in the SEAC rules, it's a very considered departure from an older version where you had to stick with consent of the parties. And, and this can be useful in tribunal somehow when they feel that a procedural tool should be available to them, even if the parties have agreed uh, otherwise. So not, not necessary, but, uh, but at the same time, not binding either. Thank you. Uh, that's an interesting and um, insightful uh, um, sharing of your, your experience, Dimitrios. Shanin, last but not the least, uh, can you tell us your experience with um, consolidation and joinder of arbitrations? How has that helped if, and aided efficiency? And any other thoughts that you may have generally, which um, in your experience could actually help uh, expedite proceedings? Thanks, thanks, Larry. Um, I'm conscious that we are left with very little time and we want to open it up for uh, Q&A. So I'm going to be brief and I'm also going to go a bit off piste. Um, I want to just touch upon uh, interim relief because although it's been partially covered by both Avinash and Dimitrios in terms of security for costs and claims, it can also be a very useful tool in aid of arbitration, particularly where you have a recalcitrant respondent. Now, anyone who's litigated in the Indian courts or anyone who knows anything about India will roll their eyes and tell you how long that litigation takes. So, a common question that I ask any client when we are filing a claim in a litigation, and that follows through to arbitration as well, is whether there is any scope for obtaining interim relief. Of course, you need relief to secure the subject matter of the property to ensure that your award or your decree doesn't simply become a paper award or decree. But it is also a tool that aids and speeds up the arbitration or the litigation process because it creates some difficulty for the defendant. So there have been, if you file a litigation, if you file a claim for just a monetary amount in, the, in an Indian court, you can take it almost for granted the defendant is not going to care. He's going to be sitting on your money for years. Whereas if you get an injunction, you get a Mareva or a freezing injunction, you get security, you get a restraint on alienation of assets, that is when the defendant also has something to lose. There's not just your money in his pocket. So similarly in arbitration as well, obtaining some interim relief or an injunction, say an injunction against sale of assets or shares, can in a sense ensure that the defendant is not laid as laid back as he possibly would. And for that, I also very quickly want to touch upon where would you seek interim relief from? Now, normally when the tribunal is constituted, you will go to the tribunal. I don't think there's, uh, there's any confusion on that. But after our 2015 amendments, even in foreign seated arbitrations, parties have recourse to Indian courts for interim relief. When would you approach an Indian court and when would you, for instance, approach an emergency arbitrator? Something that is provided for in the SEAC rules. And so some of the things you can think of is one needs to keep in mind that there is no provision for enforcement of an interim order of a foreign court or tribunal under Indian law. They cannot be enforced. Under the New York Convention, of course, you have provisions for enforcement of awards. However, the award is an award that comes from an arbitral tribunal. 
there is ambiguity as to whether an EA can be considered to be an arbitral tribunal. I know that Singapore has legislation that treats it as such. India does not. So for instance, if I required compliance with an order against an Indian party, I may approach an Indian court. If that said, most parties comply voluntarily with uh, orders passed by EAs and by tribunals. So another caveat is perhaps if you are worried that there may be some chance of non-compliance, then you come to an Indian court. Another reason you may come to an Indian court is, for example, if you require ex parte relief, where notice is not required to be given. So I just wanted to touch upon this as a technique to get an order, which I think itself helps against a recalcitrant party who is going to try and sit on his hands and eke things out as long as he can. Similarly, coming to issues of consolidation and joinder. Uh, we see particularly in construction contracts that there may be a series of interlinked agreements with contractors, subcontractors, and an ultimate employer. You see it in business transfer agreements where there may, there may be <clears throat> separate contracts for technology transfer, a separate mother shareholders agreement. And I use the word mother agreement because that is what our Supreme Court has used while ordering consolidation of various publications. And I'm not going to, again, because I'm looking at the time, I'm not going to go into detail on when you can or cannot cons uh, consolidate. <coughs> Fairly logical. You can read the rules and you can read the law. And understand. But the logic of it, it's frankly, it's common sense. Is there a connection between the agreements? Is there a connection with the parties such that you can say that a non-signatory to one agreement would nevertheless be deemed to have been a party or irretrievably connected with another agreement such that he is then deemed to be a signatory party. These are the contours that you would have to establish in which to decide whether to consolidate. And I think consolidation is much easier if there are interconnected agreements and everyone is a signatory to those agreements because of course arbitration is purely voluntary. When it comes to joinder of a non-signatory party, I think that is a little more difficult. Uh, not most institutional rules provide for consolidation. I think uh, SIAC and HKIAC also provide for the parameters for joinder of a non-party. I'm not going to go through those, but again, logically and common sense, I don't need to read the rules or the law. There needs to be some irretrievable connection of that non-signatory party. The, non, the fact of the, that he has not signed the arbitration agreement must be only a formality or a technicality. And obviously, if you con consolidate several arbitrations or several disputes in one, it streamlines the process. It uh, speeds up timelines. The evidence be consolidated, documents, pleadings are consolidated into one. And the only one other point I wanted to make was that where consolidation is not allowed, where there are common issues, there are still techniques and that is often, I can see there's only one minute left, uh, to use the arbitration or the pleadings in one arbitration in, as evidence or pleadings in another arbitration so that the issues at least are decided in one consolidated manner. Thank you. That's, thank you, uh, Shanin. That was very educative in terms of your, your, your perspective on the strategy for uh, obtaining interim relief and not just in terms of the security for costs. It can, it can, there are a whole array of uh, options open to claimants and particularly when you're dealing with a recalcitrant uh, opponent in a jurisdiction like India. Um, on that note, just before I turn to the questions, I want to get Nakul's insights in on how to deal with a recalcitrant party who for example, refuses to contribute to his share of costs. Now, 
as you know, Nakul, SIAC, and a lot of these in, uh, arbitral institutions are, are front-loaded in terms of costs. The claimant has to both, well, it's predicated on both sides paying the costs, but if the opponent refuses, then the claimant has to, to bear those costs, uh, which can actually prove to be uh, extremely unjust. Uh, any thoughts uh, from your experience on how to deal with this? How do you deal with a party who, a recalcitrant party who consistently fails to comply with timelines and whose objective all along is to delay? Right. Uh, thanks, Zareer. I, I won't take uh, more than a couple of minutes to answer your question because I know we have, we have sort of run beyond time. Uh, I, I, I have three things that I, that I would want to set out. The first, as an arbitrator, you can never lose your objectivity. So you might have a defendant who is not willing to contribute to the costs. You might have a defendant who's take, you know, delaying, but you can never lose your objectivity because you need to determine the claim on its merits. And that's extremely important. If you cannot become a subjective arbitrator just because the defendant is acting like a recalcitrant defendant. The second aspect, and I think this, this becomes extremely important, is to remember and probably try and ascertain why the defendant is acting in a particular manner. Sometimes it's just culture. Sometimes it's the counsel that the defendant has chosen. And sometimes it's just because the defendant, or I mean, and, and, it, I mean, and, and there are times when it is because the defendant has a bad case. But you've got to look into that issue also. And the reason why you need to look into that issue is because you're looking at an international commercial arbitration where parties come from different states, parties have a different approach, and you have to bear that in mind. The reason why that becomes relevant is because when the award has to be enforced, it might just get enforced in a very different jurisdiction. And it's very necessary for that court to understand how you acted as an arbitrator when you were faced with a recalcitrant defendant. And that really brings me to the third point. The third point is you've got to be able to show in your arbitral award how you have dealt with the party, because your objectivity would come out in the award. And if a court can see that you have given the counterparty, which, which is act, or, or the recalcitrant defendant, a fair opportunity to present its case, uh, you have been objective in the manner in which you've dealt with uh, that party, then there's very little reason why the tribunal, why, why the court will not go ahead and enforce the award. I mean, it makes the point you made a couple of minutes ago when you were discussing this with Avinash, which was at the end of the day, a party is looking at an enforceable award. And just coming to the last point on costs, well, the SEAC allows the claimant to file an application seeking an award for costs. And that, and that doesn't have to wait on you know, the entire arbitration. And if an application like that is made and, you, and, and it has merit, then there's no reason why as an arbitral tribunal, you can't pass an order awarding the costs and then it's for the claimant to take uh, to go ahead and enforce that award. Thank you, Nakul. That, that's uh, very, very uh, 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 insightful because it, it, it reinforces the need to ensure that the award is ultimately enforceable, notwithstanding one's biases or one has to keep one's prejudices and, aside and uh, view it, as you say, dispassionately. Um, I think that brings us to an end uh, of this for this session. And um, clearly, um, it's uh, it's been very illuminating to get everybody's perspective and experiences on board. Shweta, I believe there are a couple of questions that have been um, posed to us. Um, I think there are two questions which I've been have been shortlisted and I've been asked to, uh, to respond to. One is uh, do you see in the arbitration framework in India being transformed uh, by in terms of virtual communications and co online submissions and more speedy disposal as a result of the pandemic? Uh, clearly, yes. I think a lot of arbitral tribunals are now uh, functioning remotely. A lot of them are dealing with applications um, by emails. and. Um, Perhaps this is the new normal. I, I think if we are looking at an extended lockdown and with uh, 
fundamental shift in social norms and behavior with social distancing. Uh, clearly, um, the use of technology and arbitration in India will but only increase. So I'm, I'm quite um, hopeful on that front. Uh, there's every reason to be um, sanguine on that score. The next question is, um, is there a need to amend section 20 to clearly differentiate between place and seat of arbitration? Um, to my mind, I think um, the amendments, if at all, should be brought about to the definition of court because I think um, the confusion and the mischief uh, arose all uh, due to the definition of court under the Arbitration Act because that imported the territorial allocation of jurisdiction under Section 20 of the CPC, which clearly makes no reference or, or to seat of arbitration. So it'd be interesting to get um, Shani your view on that. Um, so, Section 20 of the Arbitration Act and uh, not the CPC, really that talks of place of arbitration, which is similar to the UNCITRAL model law. And uh, I don't have the section in front of me, but although the word place is used, it is very clear that subsections one and two of section 20 refer to the seat of arbitration and that is the legal seat of arbitration whereas subsection 3 which allows the parties to have their hearing at any place that is deemed convenient by them or the parties refers to what we use as venue now the law commission in its report had suggested that the words seat and venue be used so that it was clear because we've seen in the past and also perhaps in the last few decisions that have been issued from our courts that seat and venue can sometimes be conflated but an amendment may be a while in coming so i think what would be preferable and we do it in every arbitration clause that we put in is to use the word seat very specifically and if there is a need to have a venue, a separate venue for the hearing, then mark that. Thank you. The last word, Nakul, according to you, uh, on this front, do you think the, the expression court under Section 2 requires to be amended? If you're honestly asking me, I think nothing needs to be amended. And I'll tell you why, because the minute you bring about an amendment, you're, it again becomes a litigator's delight. You, you'll have litigation surrounding it. Uh, I think from 2012, you've had Indian case law, which is to a large extent streamlined arbitration and arbitration proceedings. We've just about managed to get to I would, what I would say is a very healthy spot. And if we can retain that healthy spot, I think you will, I mean, recalcitrant defendants who will make use of the language in, in the Arbitration Act to delay proceedings will find it very difficult. And, and I think that's, that's where I'd like it to stay. Thank you. Thank you everybody for, for, for participating. Thank you, SIAC. Thank you, Ika. Thank you, all, all, all the participants who've uh, logged into this webinar. Uh, please do send us your questions independently. We'll try and respond. And uh, stay well, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.